Coming up on Now See This. A cop asks a simple question. Y'all have any large sums of illegal money or anything like that in the car? But the answer he gets might cost him his life. What that is going for your gun? There was a Mac 11 next to the driver's seat. When heavy weather hits, a storm chaser's sense of security is shattered. And a fun-loving felon you have some fun. terrorizes Texas with 18 wheels of rolling thunder and flaming lumber. A river of fire, a mountain of snow, a world of hurt. Think you've seen it all? Now see this. In Cocoa, Florida, a man named Samuel Watts is daring police to come and get him. The incident started when this woman, a bill collector, tried to leave papers for Watts' wife regarding an unpaid balance. Watts responded by trying to run her down with his truck. Within minutes, a SWAT team headed by Sergeant Gordon Teachworth was on scene. One of the officers that were there, the minute that he saw Mr. Watts, he knew that there was going to be oh, an issue. I guess it was just his body language, the way he looked at the officer. It's obvious from his altercation with the bill collector that Watts has a short fuse. But what he does next catches even the veteran officers off guard. I came out of the house unprovoked and started shooting. Before communication has even been established, Watts appears in the doorway with a 40 caliber handgun and unloads 11 rounds at the police. On-scene officer Barbara Matthews can't believe the turn of events. I was kind of stunned. I just, even in my mind up until that point, didn't realize what this man was capable of. The unconscionable attack defies logic. Watts seems almost casual as he strolls back into the house. Police hope he went inside to rethink his approach, but he actually went to reload. How does someone come out of a home, you know, with, with innocent people everywhere, with police everywhere, and start firing at us? Two consecutive assaults, at least 21 shots fired. It's amazing no one's been hit. You hit numerous homes and cars behind us. You can just hear the bullets hitting everything. Police can't fathom what's going on inside Watts' head. But with innocent lives on the line, they have to take action first and ask questions later. At this time, myself and the other two officers that were with me made a decision that we're gonna have to engage Mr. Watts. The order is given, return deadly force with deadly force. But Watts has an advantage in position. With police sharpshooters 200 yards away and Watts protected by a wall and a stone pillar, the gunfight quickly swings in his favor. Well, you could literally hear the bullets whizzing by and skipping off the asphalt. And at one point, he hit my car twice. Bullets also plug another cruiser, missing several officers' heads by inches. I was thinking, don't make a mistake, don't do anything stupid. You have three children at home and a husband who want to hear from you. As officers desperately regroup, the standoff takes a bizarre twist. Watts emerges with a gun to his own head, but SWAT isn't falling for his trick. Watts heads for more ammo. Police can't let him reach it. I heard a bullet uh, go past my left ear. I felt like it had taken off a little bit of hair when it went by. I will never forget that sound as long as I live. Somehow, Watts reaches the safety of his home once again. But this time, police have done their damage. During our exchange of gunfire between Mr. Watts and, and the officers at the car, we struck him several times. Moments later, Watts emerges again, this time wounded and bleeding, and with no gun in hand. As police shout for him to surrender, he collapses on the lawn. SWAT moves in carefully, wary of any sudden moves, but Watts has no fight left in him. At that moment, I think that's when everyone just breathed their first sigh of relief, and we all immediately started calling loved ones. Incredibly, no one has been hit in the hailstorm of bullets except Watts. He's rushed to the hospital, where he's treated for multiple gunshot wounds to his arms and shoulders. But it easily could have been an officer on the gurney. There's no doubt in our mind that his intentions were to kill someone. He had absolutely no care for human life that day. Police are left to deconstruct the crime scene and try to make sense of the terrifying altercation. 
It appeared that he was trying to hit the gas tank on both the cars. To me, that is such a calculated act. I was very angry at this man who, in an instant, could just, just change someone else's life forever without even a care. He couldn't have cared less. Watts survives his injuries and now faces more than a dozen counts of aggravated assault, which could lead to a lifetime in prison. Perhaps the courtroom will shed light on what drove him to his violent rampage. In the meantime, officers can't rest in the fact that they responded swiftly and correctly to the deadly assault of an armed attacker. When he came out and he started shooting at us, he made the decision right then that we're going to have to return fire. He made the decision for us. Jim Leonard has been a storm chaser for 30 years, and he spent most of his day tracking tornadoes across the plains of Nebraska. Now a tornado is chasing him. The good news, he's beyond the twister's deadly winds. The bad news is, the storm can still hurt him. At first he thinks it's just a typical hailstorm. But when his car is pelted by ice chunks the size of golf balls, Jim realizes he's in big trouble. Most places you get hail, it's like pea to marble size. It just makes a little noise on your car. But when you see these big stones coming down, and they're just, you know, they wreck everything. With the cyclone behind him and the hailstorm bearing down, there's nowhere to run. And if you were to walk outside into that kind of hail, they would kill you. And just when it seems like the hail can't get any worse, it does. The windshield is busted. Hailstones the size of baseballs now pummel Jim's car. Car is being destroyed. Jim isn't the only one in danger. Over the radio, the area's emergency broadcast system is activated. Jim tries to call a friend on the CB. Casey, you out there anywhere? But Casey must be having his own problems. As moments pass, the sky grows darker and the hail intensifies. Jim's car starts to buckle under the onslaught. The front and back windows are just totally shattered. The storm seems like it will never end. Ah! But after 10 agonizing minutes, it finally stops. When there's no more sign of hail or tornado, Jim cautiously steps out to survey the damage. The roadside is littered with thousands of hailstones, many as large as Jim's fist. And like icy meteorites, they've pounded deep craters all over his car. This car's history. Jim watches with relief as the fearsome storm front rumbles off into the distance. There's what did it, right there. It was amazing to feel that, you know, that kind of power in a storm like that. He may have had to replace his car, but for a storm junkie like Jim Leonard, riding out the worst hailstorm he's ever experienced was more than worth it. Dallas, Texas, where a spectacle unfolds before the masses. This chase has been going on for half an hour now. An urban cowboy in a stolen lumber truck wheels about the city as if he's on parade. Having fun, he was having some fun. Yeah, he's crazy. Crowds gather to watch the chase unfold. Many onlookers are simply curious. Others actually encourage the truck rustler. Oh, that one guy, he just gave him a high five. Unbelievable. But officers know how dangerous this situation really is. For every pedestrian enjoying the show, there's a commuter scrambling for his life to avoid being crushed. Officers are ill-equipped to deal with a vehicle this large. Ramming it is impossible and disabling its tires may take more time than they can spare. He's on the wrong side of the road and all lanes are blocked. He's gonna have to turn. The one thing they do know, they can't afford a wait and see approach.
The driver's idea of fun is menacing bystanders, even the ones who are cheering him on. You can see people running away as he turns into that parking lot and uh, just scattering. It's time for action. Police move in, taking aim at the truck's wheels. 18 moving targets. The bullets connect, but the solution proves to be worse than the problem. There is a lot of black smoke coming from the back of the truck. Not only does the truck have enough tires to keep moving, but its exposed rims grind into the asphalt. Sparks leap to the semi's cargo, and in seconds, the lumber goes up in a burst of flames. And now the truck is on fire. This is incredibly dangerous. The big rig buckaroo's joyride now has fiery repercussions. This is no longer just a truck on the loose. It's a runaway inferno. A burning wheel suddenly blows loose and careens down the street, an unguided chunk of rolling brimstone. Pieces are flying off now. The driver presses on, relishing the bizarre turn of events. But police are about to fight fire with firepower. A white van rushes up to the semi. Inside, a tactical team of officers with orders to use deadly force. As the driver turns across a highway median, his frayed wheels get hung up on the curb. Police see their chance. Okay, he's stopped now, and, and officers are getting out. It looks like they have their guns drawn. And look, look, you can see one running up to the cab there. It, no, I think he's firing. Bullets rip through the cab as the suspect pulls away. Police aren't sure if he got hit, but one thing becomes clear very quickly. He's not giving officers another shot at him. He is really moving now, and it's hard over that curb. He really jostles the payload. The suspect panics and charges down a city street as fire continues to gnaw at the truck's lumber. Frantic to lose his pursuers, he gets an insane idea. The, the cab is, is swerving there, and oh, the lumber has fallen off all over the roadway. With a jerk of the wheel, he shakes the ravaged load loose, spilling dozens of planks into the street. Cruisers fight to stay on the semi's tail. With half the truck's cargo still threatening to topple, including a flaming forklift, officers can't get too close. Even worse, they can't get ahead to warn other vehicles. Oh no, there's a school bus, and oh no, the lumber hits the school bus. Police race forward, desperate for one more shot at the driver. but the semi swerves wildly, holding them at bay. As badly as police want this chase to end, they don't want to involve any more civilians. They wait for another opportunity. But just as they prepare to move in again, the suspect does something completely unexpected. Along a quiet stretch of highway, he rolls to a stop. It turns out that the tactical team had been successful after all. During the shootout, the suspect was grazed. Wounded, tired, and no longer having fun, he finally decides to surrender. But as he's taken into custody, officers make a startling discovery. This man had stolen another truck just weeks ago. But instead of showing up for his trial, he skipped out and went on another joyride instead. Even under arrest, he flashes a devious grin for the cameras. Instead of just going down in a court of law, he had more fun going down in a blaze of glory. If you want to witness the athletic ballet that is extreme skiing, you're in the wrong place. Today's hottest extreme skiers are caught eating it all over the slopes of Montana. If they miss the mark, they're toast. Most hide their face in shame, but some are proud of their war wounds and prefer to bear it all. Skiing monster mountains seems insane. But the competition settings aren't any safer. A skier hits the ramp on cue, catches air, 
and slams into the ramp's steel-plated deck. Swallowing snow isn't tasty. Falling down can rip up your knees. And busting up your gear can cost you big time. So why do they keep doing it? Because the only thing that gets more cheers than the perfect trick is the killer wipeout. Ooh. It's 4 a.m. in Los Angeles, but in this city, traffic never sleeps. In a freeway construction zone, a van has stalled in the fast lane. Drivers should be slowing down and paying attention, but one of them isn't. Cameraman Paul Anderegg, who is simply trying to get footage of the construction area, is breathless. He calls for help. Multiple injuries, I need CHP ASAP. Paul spots a young couple in the Mustang who miraculously appear to be conscious, but Paul is helpless to reach them. They're stuck inside the vehicle, a vehicle that's now in the danger zone itself. These two people are sitting in their Mustang, they're gonna get killed. It's like being caught in a high-speed shooting gallery. Only these bullets weigh around 3,000 pounds, and the hits are just getting started. As the second set of victims checks the damage to their vehicles, Paul frantically tries radioing information to the police. Southbound 405, north of Victory, one, two, four, and five lanes, four vehicles involved, at least two injuries. The stranded couple still can't move, and with the road now choked by even more wreckage, this nightmare is far from over. Paramedics are coming, okay? When a thick pocket of traffic bears down on the accident site, there's nowhere for cars to maneuver, and nothing Paul can do but watch. Another five vehicles involved. The disoriented motorists get out of their cars to check on each other. It's a natural reaction, but in the middle of a busy freeway, it's one that could prove deadly. Run! By the time the rescue crews arrive, the mess involves nine vehicles, all demolished in less than three minutes. The couple in the Mustang have to be extracted from the mangled scrap of their car. She suffers a broken ankle, while he has a broken leg. Incredibly, there are no other major injuries to report. But from what Paul saw, he knows it could have been much different. It all started with one second of lost concentration. The other drivers were simply following too close or not looking far enough down the road. Uh, we call that in the Highway Patrol high visual horizon, which means you always need to look further down the road. A lot of people just look at their hood or the next car in front of them, um, but sometimes a hazard might be further down the road, and that's what you need to focus on. From the dark morning hour to the construction zone, to the stalled car. The situation was primed for a disaster. Tonight, everyone was lucky, and Paul caught an amazing story where the only big casualties were the cars. On the interstate running through Montgomery, Alabama, KG veteran officer Mike Darden and his partner seem to be ready to let this driver go with a warning. Here's your uh, vehicle information. Yeah, make sure the date's right, yeah. All right, All right. everything checked out. I this is where most traffic stops end. However, Darden has a hunch this case is just beginning. Hey, Mr. Norman, y'all take care, right, bud. All right, have a good day. Right. Hey, can I ask you another question, Mr. Norman? He was given back his driver's license and he was free to go and once he was free to go, the traffic offense was completed. Technically, the man can leave at any time, but he opens the legal floodgates by volunteering to answer some questions. Y'all don't have any weapons in the car, do you? Okay. Y'all have any large sums of illegal money or anything like that in the car? No. Okay. Y'all have any drugs or anything in the car? No. At that point, it's whenever I notice him get real nervous. Uh, his body language changed. Uh, his breathing changed, uh, his uh, actions, so I knew there might be something to this. The man is unaware that narcotics officers have tipped off Darden and his partner. 
This guy and his buddies in the car have been under surveillance for days. Darden plays it cool. Well, like I said, this is something I ask everybody when I'm out on my traffic stops and all that, okay? Uh, and having said that, would you mind if I search your vehicle real quick? I ain't, I ain't, I ain't doing anything. No, no, I, I didn't say you did anything. That's not now Darden's in a bind. He can't legally hold him, but his experience tells him, don't let this guy go. So he stalls. So I don't see why, why she don't. Why, why, are you, why are you real nervous and all that? I'm just paranoid of police like this. Uh, there, there's no reason to be paranoid. Like I said, this is what I do, and this is, I ask everybody that I'm out on the traffic stop with. Do you have any drugs in the car? No. Okay, no marijuana? No. Okay, no cocaine? No. He can't search the vehicle, but he can bring in a drug-sniffing dog without violating the suspect's right to privacy. Call a K-9 unit. When the man hears this, his tension level skyrockets. You're real nervous, okay? And, and you got nervous. nervous. You I'm got nervous like nervous. that around police. That's whenever the subject then, he became really nervous, had enough probable cause at that time to temporarily detain him. At this moment, the officers are ready for several reactions. Anger, flight, violence. But the twitchy suspect throws them for a loop when he threatens to call his mother. But I'm, I'm going to call my mama. I got to have my mama. No, sir, stay right gonna, down there. No, sir, no, sir, you're going to stay right up here. I knew that if he made it back to that car, either he was going to get a weapon or there was going to be a high-speed pursuit. Suddenly, it's a roadside scuffle. My dad is going for your gun. It takes two strong officers to subdue this suspect. Who has good reason to fight. Because what they later find inside will prove him to be one dangerous mama's boy. If you don't put it behind me. A further search of the vehicle, there was a Mac 11 next to the driver's seat in the console. There was a black bag found to contain approximately eight ounces of crack cocaine. And in the trunk area of the car, there was approximately 1.7 pounds of powder cocaine. They were charged with possession with intent to distribute. They're looking at anywhere from 20 years to life. But they might have gotten away had Officer Darden not played it just right. Now they're under arrest. And with his one phone call from jail, you can guess who the driver is going to call. I'm going to call my mama, man. I'm going to call my mama. The Big Island of Hawaii is a place of beauty and great danger. It's home to several active volcanoes where rock is melted to liquid and the ground explodes with lava as hot as 1,200 degrees Fahrenheit. For most people, this looks like hell on Earth. So why are these people strolling through the heart of a volcano? They call themselves lava walkers, but they're not here on a nature hike. They're part of the U.S. Geological Survey, risking their lives to study Hawaii's volcanoes up close and personal. Don Swanson is a volcanologist at the Hawaiian Volcano Observatory, perched right on the rim of the Kilauea volcano. He may not look like a daredevil, but Don's been hooked on lava walking since his first time out in 1968. I was just amazed to actually see lava spitting out of the ground that way and plopping down around us. You can actually be walking on a moving lava flow if you take care and select the right kind of flow. And Don knows his flows. The best kind has a crust thick enough to support a group of lava walkers. But they'd better watch their step. I've been in a couple of instances where you get several footsteps across this stuff before you really realize what's happening. And the question is, do you continue on or do you turn around? For the lucky ones who just break through, the crust is just a hollow shell. But for the unlucky... We've had a couple of accidents here, and they've badly burned their legs by falling into molten lava. In both cases, skin grafts were necessary to their legs, and it was quite a bad experience. Of course, a lava bath is dangerous. But in this environment, even the air is hot enough to melt some kinds of clothing. We take caution that we don't wear synthetic clothes because they have lower melting temperatures. Despite the danger, the data Don and his intrepid lava walkers gather makes all their risks worthwhile. It's a challenge that is important for society because the better that we learn to understand eruptions, the more chances we have to predict them. So Don and his team will continue their research knowing that in their line of work, 
danger is always just beneath the surface.